Uh, thanks, Wayne. Thank you, Ed, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as as, as uh, Wayne said, I am a financial journalist. I'm currently a columnist uh, with Market Watch, and I've been extremely interested in the economics of immigration for a long time. I mean, essentially, uh, in this country, in the 1960s, uh, the government decided that the U.S. was sort of moving towards being Switzerland. Its population would get increasingly integrated and homogenous, and even the, the, the minority that it had, which was then only African Americans, was converging with the whites in terms of their economic performance. Uh, and the government decided, and it was the government that decided this, it wasn't something that happened naturally, that instead America was not going to be Switzerland, it was going to be Brazil. And they've imported a whole lot of new minorities, which have co and, and have vastly increased the population. And the result of this is that we see uh, a much higher population. We see divergences between economic performance of these new, new, uh, and different and different groups. Uh, and we, we see tremendous increase in uh, in wage inequality because the impact of immigration on the wages is a ma one major issue. And we see that, as it happens, African American progress simply stalled in the 1970s. They've they've not been catching up with whites uh, as they were in the previous several decades. Now, the really interesting thing to, about this to me as a financial journalist is that the consensus among economists, labor economists who look into this, uh, is and has been for nearly 20 years that there's no significant benefit to the native born from this enormous influx that's taken place since the 1960s. It does increase the size of the economy. But the great bulk of that, essentially all of that increase, goes to the immigrants themselves. The native born uh, are no better off. Uh, that's the macroeconomic conclusion. You've not read it in the Wall Street Journal because the Wall Street Journal's never published it. But it is, in fact, in, in the technical literature, and it has been certainly since I published my book on immigration, uh, Alien Nation, in 1995. Now, what Ed Rubenstein is doing is, 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 a, is looking to sla is a, at a narrower set of this question. Uh, he's looking not at the macroeconomic impact, but at the fiscal impact, the impact on the federal government. Uh, uh, he's, he's addressing really the, the paradox that the great uh, economist uh, Milton Friedman said, actually, it, to me, in an interview I did with Forbes about 10 years ago. It's not possible to combine mass immigration and the welfare state. It's madness to try to combine immigration and the welfare state. But, and that doesn't mean just welfare. He means transfer payments of all kinds, which simply didn't exist at the time of the last great wave of immigration uh, in, the, in the 1900s. We've had mass immigration before, we've had the welfare state, but not together. We've never seen how they work together and the paradoxical and disincentivizing effects that they produce. Now, Ed has looked into this now in great detail and he's able to see what the cost of this immigrant presence has been to the American taxpayer. And he finds, of course, that the American taxpayer is essentially subsidizing, the American taxpayers are essentially subsidizing their own displacement. The reason why the, the, the economics of immigration works now largely because of, ta of transfers from the taxpayers to the immigrants is a huge and peculiar paradox. And it's a very good question why the federal government hasn't tried to look into this uh, effect and tried to measure it in the past, but it hasn't. So Ed's had to do it. Now, uh, I, I'll just turn to Ed now. I've known him for, Ed for 20 years uh, since we were both uh, working for National Review. Well, that's another story. <laughs> um, and uh, he's not only an economist, he was trained at Johns Hopkins, and he thinks in the peculiar way that economists think, but he also knows where the bodies are buried. What I mean by that is that there's an enormous amount of technical literature out there, and all kinds of, uh, of government studies and surveys that have been done and forgotten and buried and buried, and, so, and he knows where they are. And, I and so when you I say to him, hey, there's any numbers on immigration to US, from the US, he says, well, there has to be numbers because I've seen it such a thing and such a thing, I'll look into it for you, which he just said to me a few moments moments ago. Uh, so uh, in other words, I immediately realized uh, that he was a tremendous resource. And he's not only a tremendous resource, but he's a very nice fellow and he doesn't mind being badgered by editors at midnight to go and look up a new number and, and, and uh, to having his copy rewritten in savage ways and things like that. So I glommed onto him and we, we've been working together ever since. For years we did uh, uh, a series of, uh, of articles in Forbes that we called Charticles, which were based on uh, the visual representation of quantitative information. I still, I do them now with him at Market Watch, and he does a column for me at VDA, uh, which we call National Data, the successor to the old um, uh, right date that they used to do for National Review. So I'm going to get out of the way now and turn you over to Ed Rubenstein. Thank you.